We're not weird because we're dancing. You're weird because you're not dancing. Well, I'm just, I'm just not emotional. If your son got hit by a truck, they pronounced him dead and you saw the body. And three days later, the doorbell rang. And your son was alive, whole, and well in front of your door. You would probably go, really nice to see you. I'm not, I'm not emotional. Come on. You would grab that boy. Oh my God! What? Come on, somebody. The doorbell just rang. He's alive. You're alive. The question isn't why do we dance? The question is why don't you dance? If you've been redeemed and you've been set free, there's an emotion that stirs up in us that says, oh my goodness, I've got to lift my hands and lift my voice. I've got to give God praise. He's been too good to me. I've got to shout unto the Lord. I've got to lift my voice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, praise team. Romans chapter 8 and 28. Philippians 4, 19. And as you go there, we're so highly honored that you're with us as guests, friends. We're so glad that all the regular customers are here. We, we talk about the, the guest, and we're glad you're here, guest. But I've been with T-Mobile forever, and I'm always seeing advertisements for the new customer. And I called them the other day, and I said, what about the old customer? I said, I just, I just feel like I've been with y'all for a long time. And you giving the new people new phones and charging me full price. So they gave me a free month. I was like, wow, I'm going to call in every month. Amen. And be like. <laughs> but I'm thankful for the faithful. And we're glad you're here and we're thankful if you're a guest. We're so thankful. We're just a distinct honor to have Brother and Sister Shepherd with us, a missionaries to uh, the country of Zimbabwe, Africa. We say the African missionaries, brother uh, Grim, are the real missionaries. You know, I was a missionary to the Netherlands, and that's that's still almost real. Then you've got the missionaries to the Bahamas. So I've got him coming to Beyond Borders next year. Be, the missionary to Bahamas, so we can really see. We want to hear some stories, and they better not be about a beach. And hmm. Anyway, I've, I've felt the call for a long time to Aruba. God's been on, tugging on my heart. It's been there. I just... Brother and Sister Shepherd, we honor you, and they'll be speaking to our leadership team this afternoon. And, of course, we want to remember Brother Harold, uh, his family. He passed uh, just this last week neighboring pastor for many, many years, a legend in the apostolic movement right here in Bridge City, um, is known and well documented that some of the great preachers in the apostolic movement consulted Brother Harold for the counsel in the preaching. He was a master of the pulpit, an incredible preacher, and he was an incredible pastor, and uh, he passed, and so we want to remember him, uh, his family, and the, our brothers and sisters in Bridge City as they mourn the loss of an incredible man of faith. And as we take that family to the Lord in prayer, we also want to remember Sister Debbie Scott just rushed to the ER with some symptoms. Amen. We know our God is able. And if you have a need, you can just lift your hands. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your power and presence. You're in the house today. You bring comfort to those who mourn. I thank you that we can live this life going through the challenges, the pain, the turmoil and trials, but with a comfort that our hope is not in this world, but it is in the one beyond. So, Lord, now bear up, strengthen those who mourn. Bring comfort, Lord, to the church, our church family, our neighbors. I pray, Lord, for friends and family that, that weep today, that you would bring comfort for Sister Scott now. Let the angels of the Lord visit that hospital room in Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Somebody shout, in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Romans chapter 8 and 28 in the Philippians. And just if you could help me out, we are growing so quickly. Um, if you have kids and uh, they like to run uh, in and out, 
uh, be important for their safety. If you could just uh, accompany them, uh, they, 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 we are on the interstate, and not everybody got the Holy Ghost, amen? So, so for their protection, their safety, and don't get an attitude if our ushers bring them back to you, okay? So we're just doing that to keep them safe. That's what, that's, that's what they do, and so thank you all for understanding that. Romans 8 and 28, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Then the Bible says, Paul writes as well, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning quickly on the perspective of provision, the perspective of provision. Father, I thank you for your word, your people. I thank you for your name. Anoint me now to speak that which you've given to me and steady to deliver it, Lord, with grace to those that you love so much. Be with us in the coming moments. Draw us closer to you as we build our lives and construct them on the eternal principles of your word. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. And as one people, we say in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. I think since we've been an inviter, I've done 10,001 personality profile test. Um, it's a thing right now. You know, uh, what person that, when I was a kid, it was outgoing and shy. Those were the two. You were outgoing or you were shy, and then they got real scientific. It was extroverted or introverted. Then we went to four personalities, sanguine, melancholic, choleric, and uh, phlegmatic. And then in my 20s, they came up with this thing called the DISC assessment, dominant, influential, steady, and compliant. Some people aren't good with letters. So then they came up with colors, and they added in a few additional personalities. There's the orange ones, the red ones, the yellow ones, the purple ones, the blue ones, the green ones. I was doing something a while back. Someone said, oh, you're orange. I said, right now, I'm red, hot, red. <laughs> it ain't orange. <laughs> it's called angry. <laughs> Now I Google, look, I, how many, the Google's come up with a whole new thing. There's, according to the, the, the Google, there are 16. We went from two to four to eight to 16, and I don't know. This is not that really, I know this is freaking some of you guys out right now. Oh, God, I got to get home and do another personality profile test. Which of the 16 am I? I thought I had it settled. I was a D, and now I'm uh, an orange, and now, oh, God, I'm just, I know it's throwing everybody off. I mean, we used to just test your IQ, but now you got to know your IQ and your EQ and what color and which DIC you are and which of the 16 personalities you are. I was at a funeral recently for Brother Gilbert's uh, uh, wife, Brother Darren Gilbert's my dear friend. I served on the youth committee with him. We got together. A lot of us, uh, it was almost like a reunion of the youth committee of my generation 20 years ago. And we were talking and reminiscing. Brother Enzi was our youth president of the Texas district at the time, and he took us to, as a committee, as a team, to this uh, leadership training place. It was a, a farm, and it was just us, 10 or 12 guys, however many were on the committee, and we spent three days there learning leadership things, and it was, it was incredible, and I, I actually brought it up and thanked him for that weekend, but one of the things we had to do three weeks before we got there was fill out a personality profile thing and uh, um, so they sent me this link on the internet and I clicked on it and it, it said first question was which would describe you best quickly angered impatient procrastinator or do things in haste <laughs> I was like can we put indecisive here? Like all, I want to just, I, I can't select all. I'm all of those things. I'm all the bad and none of the good, you know? And I was like, this is just frustrating. Uh, this frustrates me. It made me quickly angry. <laughs> I'm like, I got a little baby I'm raising right now. I got, I got houses to flip. I'm evangelizing. I'm serving on this youth committee, helping my father-in-law manage 41 spots in the trailer park. I'm married to an expensive wife who's super hot. I've got a 1991 Lincoln Town Car falling apart. I got a lot going on, and I don't have time for all this, and it just made me mad, so I put it off. And then I'm driving to this farm. I'm like, oh, man, I realize I procrastinated. <laughs> uh, so I'm on the road, 
And back then I had this little thing I could put in my laptop, a USB that you put up on the roof of your car that would connect you to the internet. It was really cool. I'm connected to the internet and I'm filling out this thing and I'm just clicking. I'm like, who cares? Click, 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 click. I did not read the questions. I just click, 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 click. We're getting this done, baby. It don't matter in my life. This ain't, I'm getting, not getting paid. I'm just getting this done. So I step into the room and we all sitting around this table and he brings in this lady that he pays some astronomical amount of money and all she does in life is study personalities. She starts on the left, I'm on the right here, we go around and, and she has this chart of every person and she's got their name and, and it's this chart and it's high, you're high D, low C, so that means you're gonna be very strong personality, struggle with the organization and you are influencer and all that, that, that. And it's just like a mountain, you know. And then, and then finally she gets to me, and she's like, okay, your name must be Matthew Tuttle. I said, that's me. She said, I've been waiting. Oh, I've been waiting to meet you. <laughs> she put mine up there, flatline, like I was dead, you know. <laughs> but then she gave me, she said these words, which forever changed my life. It really has nothing to do with the sermon, but I needed to tell you guys this because I'm kind of proud of it. She said, I've never seen this in all my years. She said, this would have been the personality of Jesus. Oh, it was great. And so they all had to get together in their little teams, and she'd be like, that's all right, Matt. You just pick whichever team you want to be in. I'd be like, I know, I'm Jesus. I mean, you know, what can I say? I mean, just call me Jesus for the rest of the day, you know? <laughs> I hadn't tried. It just the Lord was working through me. <laughs> so anyway that was that so I'm, I guess I'm just hard to figure out I don't know it's weird you know when I take these things one time I'm this and the next time I'm that maybe I'm just bipolar I don't know what it is I just struggle uh, but I do know I, I don't like things to go different than when I plan them when I make a plan I like I like to plan being spontaneous you know what I'm saying? Like we are. We, Michelle and I, we'll, I'll be like, let's just go to the airport and we'll decide where we did it recently. This, this year already. We're driving the airport. I'm like, let's decide where we're going to go. Are we going to go to Rio, Amsterdam, or are we going to go to the Bahamas? And we'll just sit there and kind of makes her a little nervous. But once we lock in the destination, I booked the tickets on the way to the airport. That's where we're going. We're not changing things. And when we have the service schedule lined up, I like it to just kind of, we have a clock. You guys know I'm pretty structured. I like things to go uh, the, the way it is. I remember uh, just last year, Michelle and I were on our way to uh, the, uh, um, some marriage retreat thing for us. Uh, well, for me. <laughs> uh, because she's good. I'm, I'm the one that needs all that. And we're driving her car. At the time, it had 30,000 miles. It's a brand new car. And on my way, I'm almost to Houston, of course, it's raining. It's always raining in this story. Pow! Tire blows. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. This, this is not good. We're not going to make it to the deal because I know this is going to take forever and I get out, and, you know, Christian, my, all the Christian curse words are in my mind. I'm not saying them. This man eventually pulls over. His name's Jerome. We still text, super nice guy. He's helping me out. We, we get, but it still takes forever, you know, getting the tire out. And because the jack, a brand new car, the jack thing that they give you doesn't work. It just didn't work. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. So he went, literally went and uh, went up all the way up, bought a jack for me, came back, and really cool. Yay, whatever. I gave him I gave him a great two hundred dollars, so don't don't feel sorry for him. He was blessed. Hey man, he's really glad that he he stopped, I promise. Uh, <laughs> then I get back in the car and we're driving five miles up the road and there's a wreck. And I'm talking a devastating wreck. Uh, and I realized it had happened between the the the, the, the flat tire and me leaving. I knew the wreck wasn't there when I started because I'm impatient and GPS says if there's a wreck, I'm going to drive all the way to Canada to go around it. I mean, it might take me six hours longer, but I'm not sitting still. <laughs> and so I knew that wreck wasn't there, but, but then I got in my car and the wreck was there and just did a little math in my head and I realized that had I not had a flat tire 
And I hear some mm hmms. Oh, yeah, because each and every one of you have experienced what I'm talking about. And I can say at least 10 times that I can think of in my life as I this week was trying to go through times like this where I was frustrated, you know, by things. And then I realized I was thinking about a girl I dated. Of course, she was hideously ugly. Uh, oh, baby, she was like, ooh, oh, you know. And dad told me to break up with her, and it was hard, and it's hard because, you know, you think you're in love, and you think you know everything, and you've mastered love, and your parents are idiots and complete clueless people. Uh, but, but I still trusted this clueless individual called my dad, and I said, okay, well, if you said to do it, since you, you know, I kind of want to be in on the will, <laughs> I'll break it up, you know, but it was a money thing, I got to be honest. Uh, I broke up with her. That was hard. Two months later, I'm at North American Youth Congress. You're like, Pastor, why aren't you talking? It's that, like, there's no words. That kind of beauty. She came by. Like, I've always, like I say often, the only thing wrong with her was her last name. <laughs> Gilmore, I got that fixed quick and in a hurry. I pursued, I conquered, and now I'm king. You know what I mean? I got that taken care of. And that ain't Sister McCoy no more. No, sir. That is Sister Tuttle. It's amazing so now I'm really glad I broke up with that lady that girl I don't even remember her name I don't remember any of their names it's amazing how when your perspective changes you can see God's hand of provision isn't it amazing how when the perspective changes you can look back and see the provision of God in your life Wednesday night we talked about Jonah. We spoke uh, more about the men on the boat who lost their purpose because of who they traveled with. Jonah had told them, throw me overboard. Trust me, I ain't going to preach it again. For all the people that are here Wednesday night, no, I'm not going to let the people that don't come get the sermon. That would be unfair to you for coming. But he said, throw me over, and they refused. And he, I, I was like, well, why didn't he just jump, right? Because sometimes you've got to make the cut. You've got to cut them out of your life. Some people aren't going to leave you. You're going to have to throw them overboard. And, and, uh, and that's an incredible thing. And, and, and the sermon was even better than that singular point. You should have been here on Wednesday night. Just throwing in like a commercial for Wednesday night. Hallelujah. We had 500 people here on 496 on Wednesday night. That's pretty incredible. So if you ain't coming, you're missing out, baby. Punch your own self in your face. And what's interesting, though, is I, it was caught in the story. of I try to delve in and really extrapolate as much as I can from a particular story on the book of Jonah. Uh, it doesn't tell us that it was written by Jonah, but most all theologians agree that Jonah wrote the book of Jonah. He's writing about himself, the story of his life. And so in verse 3 of the first chapter, and he says, Jonah was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. He, he didn't go to Nineveh. He went to Tarshish. He ran away. Now, I don't think that while Jonah was running away from God that he was saying, I'm running away from God. I don't think that while he was in it, he was saying, I'm going to do this to be a rebel. I am going to, no, no, he, he was thinking it doesn't make sense. That Surely that wasn't God. That was probably just my thoughts. I'm, you know, he was justifying it some way. And, 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 and later on, though, when he begins to write it, he says, whoa, no, that wasn't me just, just putting it into my own logic. That was me running from God. I mean, that's what, exactly what, and then he writes the story, and he says he got into a boat, and, and the boat, uh, what's interesting is he goes to sleep in a move of God. This man is so complacent, he can sleep through a move of God. He's unmoved while God is moving. I'm going to tell you a dangerous thing in your life is when we're having revival and you're not moved by it. If, we're, if there's a move of God and you're not moving, you ought to be pretty scared. You're kind of in a Jonah situation. Come on. And the Bible says that the only solution was just throw me overboard. And so the Bible says they threw him into the water. In verse 17 of chapter 1 of Jodah, now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Larry, that the Bible says that God prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Now, in, in, in just Realville, where I live as a permanent resident, this, this, this right here is, is, is pretty bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
he, he is thrown in, and I can, just in real, but this is how it happened. They threw him over the board, and while Jonah's in the air, midair, I, he's going, oh, Jesus, I'm so sorry. You know it's right. You know that's what you'd have been saying. I'll do whatever you say. God, just get me out of this. Whatever you say, save me. I'll go to Nineveh. I, I, oh, God, what did I do? You know, he's good. And, and, and the Bible says as soon as he hit the water, the storm is silent. Verse 15, so they took up Jonah, throw him in the sea, and the sea ceased from raging. He hits the water. There's no more storm. I've got to say, I'm so proud of the sailors. They didn't pick him back up. You're like, what are you saying? I'm saying that when you get rid of them and there's peace in your life, I've seen people do it over and over. They, get, they cut the connection, life gets better, and they're like, oh, now that it's better, I'll get trouble back in the boat. But they were smart enough to say, storm's over, you were the problem, you're not getting back in. They said this is a permanent disconnection. This is permanent. I, this is over. This is over. There, and there's some things in your life that will have to be a per, Your connection to alcohol is a permanent disconnection. Your connection to drugs is a permanent disconnection. You're never going to get to the place, well, you know what? I think I could visit that website and just look at a little bit of pornography. No, that's a permanent disconnection. You can't go back. That's what brought trouble in your marriage in the first place. You getting on social media and talking to girls and getting into forums that's got to be a permanent disconnection in your life you got to get rid of that stunk for good for good it's gone I'm gone and there he is and, and, and they're cruising on in peace life is better yeah, they ain't going to die now and Jonah's in a calm sea no life vest no lifeboat he's just trying to stay above water at this point and all of a sudden he sees a dorsal fin Come on. And y'all are like, oh, I know what I'd have done. I'd have been like, oh, thank you, Jesus. The Lord has provided. No. <laughs> You'd have been like, oh, my God, it's a shark. <laughs> and, you, and that fish is coming, and you are swimming not towards his mouth. You're not like, hey, hurry up. Let me get in his belly. Right? You're like, Jesus, help me. You've got to be kidding me. I asked for help, and you send a shark. You send a whale. You send a fish to eat me up. But the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow him up. It, it, it don't look like preparation. It sure don't look like provision. It actually looks like a problem. Let me just say that again. It doesn't look like provision. It doesn't look like God's hand of preparation. It seems to me like this is more like a, a problem, a shark in the middle of the sea, a fish, a whale eating me up in the middle of the ocean. This is not the solution, but sometimes the provision looks like a problem. I guess I'm just preaching to me, but I got some problems that I think are, are, are not God, but maybe what I'm in is not maybe what you're going through is God saving you not killing you maybe the, the provision and I just need a perspective of God's provision to realize that God does work all things together for good that God works it together for good hallelujah hallelujah I said it looks it don't always make sense can you imagine Paul and Silas up in a prison they're singing and shouting, all of a sudden, an earthquake hits. I mean, their whole world is shaking. This doesn't look like provision. This looks like death and a problem. But the earthquake was not a problem. It was provision, mask as a problem that was going to get them out of where they were. What are you saying? I'm saying if you're in the belly of a whale, if you are shaking in your life, be of good cheer. It's going to be okay. Hallelujah. And as I was reading it, Brother Edwards, I, 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 now Paul and Silas, it makes sense to, for God to get them out. They're giving God praise. Jonah is running. He's complacent. And God still provided for him. I said, 
Jonah isn't singing praises and doing what's right. He's going the wrong direction. He's casual. He's missing church. He's not responding to altar calls. He's not being faithful with his tithe. He's complaining about revival, which is Nineveh. He's in a very bad, almost backslidden condition. But God didn't link his provision to Jonah's protection. Come on, somebody. Uh, perfection, I mean. Uh, what are you saying? I'm saying no matter how bad you've been, uh, no matter how wrong you are, uh, that the problem you're in might not be the judgment of God. Uh, it might be the... I wish I had somebody that knows what it's like to go through some prisons and, and go through some marital conflict and realize that it was the marital mess. God kept me safe even when I was stupid. God preserved me when I was perverted. God watched over me even when I was wicked. I didn't even see it then, but my perspective of his provision has changed. I said my perspective of the provision has changed. And that leaves me with only one thing to do. I've only got one thing I've left to do. And when the perspective of your provision changes and you realize, Jonah 2 and 9, he said, here's what I'm going to do. He said, I will. That means worship. That's how they, in the Old Testament, when you see sacrifice, that's modern worship. He said, and I will give God thanks. He said, when I look and my perspective of the problem is a realization and a revelation that really this was not a problem, this was provision. I only have one option. Why are you dancing? Ah, because I just got a perspective that what I'm going through isn't going to kill me. It's actually what's going to save me. So if you're in a storm, shout on. If you're in the waters, worship. If you're in the belly, go ahead and bless the Lord. Go ahead and give him praise because the provision is coming through the form of what you're calling a problem. Oh, can somebody just look in the rearview mirror of your life uh, and see God's hand? Uh, can, can, you, can you give him praise? Uh, come on, for the marriage trouble that saved your marriage, for the conflict that brought you closer. Hallelujah. Praise God. I could quit right there, but... That's like having credit on a credit card that expires the next day. I'm using all that money. I'm buying things I don't need. You know what I mean? I'm going to go ahead and preach up my 18 minutes. And Jonah, the Bible says, he went to Nineveh. And they had a revival and the whole city repented. And Tristan, here's what's amazing. It displeased four and one. There's only four chapters in the book of Jonah. He's got the greatest revival known to the to human man, and he's ticked off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've, I've met people like this up here. They can be angry about good things, you know what I mean? He's not happy. God says, bro, why aren't you happy? He said, well, because I knew you would save them. He said, I knew you'd give them grace. And that really ticks me right on off. Because I kind of feel like they deserved it. I feel like they earned it. I feel like, you know, isn't it amazing that the dude running from God that was complacent is the one complaining because somebody got saved. Let me say that again. The dude that really deserved to get eat up and die and was causing other people to lose their stuff and was a disaster and breaking relationships and running from God is the guy mad that these, well, those people, man, they just smell bad, you know? Oh, they, they smell bad? How do you think you smelled when you showed up coming out of the whale's barf? Like, you didn't smell like the latest Louis Vuitton perfume, baby. You smelled like whale puke when you came into the house. You were stinky. You were messy. You were gory. Your life was jacked up. Now you got a suit and tie on, and you're part of the greatest revival. You better not look at somebody up at an altar, a man dressed like a woman, confused about their gender, that's struggling to find identity, that smells like vomit, beer, and marijuana mixed together, and say, well, I just don't think they deserve it. You ought to come on. You ought to say, if he did it for me, he can do it for you 
my perspective, come on, has changed to where when a sinner comes in, I say, whoo, he's about to save you. He's about to deliver you. He's about to set you free. I haven't got so far in... And he's complaining, and God, in verse 6 of chapter 4, and the Lord prepared a gourd and made it, it was like a big plant, and covered him up that he might have shadow and deliver him from his grief. I'm ticked at God right now. Jonah has run, he slept, God's provided for him, he, they're having revival, he's mad. And God puts a plan over him to shade him so he could be comfortable. <laughs> and then, then he got glad. Read, your, read it, it's up on the screen. That's in the, that's in the real Bible too, trust me. It's in the real Bible, the one with pages. And Jonah was exceeding glad because of the revival. Jonah was exceeding glad 120,000 people aren't going to hell anymore. He was exceeding glad that they were reaching their world and giving to missions. No, he was glad because he was comfortable. Let it be that what we celebrate is not our comfort. We celebrate the angels in heaven don't rejoice over our comfort. They rejoice over our revival. What do we... That's why we have connection celebration. When, the, when that face comes on that screen, you ought to get on your feet and say, yeah, louder. I know you get excited when I talk about how God has given you a house and blessed you with a car, put your life back together, but better than that, he saved a sinner from hell. He got somebody out that was lost. Come on, somebody, I'm comfortable. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you for those things. But more importantly, I want to be a part of a revival. I said, I want to be a part of a revival. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So God said, all right. Hmm. I'm going to have to prepare you something. In verse 7, so God prepares a worm. He prepares a well. Now he's prepared a worm. And that worm goes up in there and eats that plant. And that thing dies, brother. He's like, oh, I just love this place. Things are so good. It's comfortable. Life is great. We've got it all good. Oh, it's so great. And here comes a worm. Eats up his covering plant. He's in love with his house he's in love with his comfort and so God prepares something uh, that eats up his comfort let me tell you if all we celebrate is our comfort God can prepare, prepare a worm we've got two choices come on and well we've only got one it's revival Revival and seeing the lost get saved is the only option. And God is going to have revival one way or the other. Has said he's going to have one way or the other. And I'm going to say, you know what, God, I'd rather keep my house and have revival. So let me stay active in the field. Let me stay active in the field. I don't need the worm to be prepared. I want to have revival in my city, in my home, in my family. So now he's sitting out there in the sun. But old Jonah's stubborn. He's just sitting there with his bad attitude. And so God said, all right, I'll keep on providing. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a violent wind. God prepared a violent a whale. He provided a worm and now there's a wind and the sun was beating on his head and he fainted and wished that he'd die <laughs> sometimes God's provision isn't a word 
Sometimes it's not a cute sermon. Sometimes it's not goosebumps in a song. Sometimes his provision is not a check in the mail. Sometimes his provision is not, come on, a, a good feeling. Sometimes his provision isn't a word in the altar call that shikamo shy, kick the devil in the eye. Sometimes it's a whale. Sometimes it's a worm. Sometimes it's a wind. Sometimes it's conflict in your home. Sometimes it's trouble in your mind. Sometimes, come on, somebody, it's bills that you don't have the, the money to pay. Just that's just that's it's not a problem. That's God. What you call a problem, he calls provision. I said what you call a problem is what he calls provision. And then God said, you, you're more sad about losing your house in verse 10 than you are about people getting saved. He said, I've got to save Nineveh. He said, they called on me. He said, and I saved them. And there was revival. And that's where it ends. The whole book's done. What does Jonah do? I think in this place, maybe God's like, Matt, you can finish the story of Jonah. I'm like, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I, I, I think that his new perspective of his provision caused him to get up and lay the pen down and say, let's not even write this story anymore. I, you know what I'm going to do? Uh, I'm going to get up and I'm going to be like Paul. I, he, Paul said it this way. He said, not that I speak in ret respect of want. He said, for I've learned. Paul has learned that whatever state I'm in, therewith to be content. He said, I know how to abase and, and I know how to abound. He says, I know how to be broke and I know how to be blessed. He says, in everything I've been instructed, he said, I have been full. He said, I know what it's like to eat filet mignon. Come on, from Papa Doza. And I know what it's like to scrape around and, and try to get some ramen noodles. Come on, somebody. I know what it's like to be poor. I know what it's like to be rich. I know what it's like to be healthy. I know what it's like to be unhealthy. He said, but this this is what he says in verse 13. He said, but all, knowing all of that, I can do all. He said, I can make it through poverty because I can do it through Christ. I can make it through the sickness through Christ. I've got a perspective of the problem and I realize it's provision. I can do all things through Christ. What are you saying? I'm saying no matter what you're in, you're going to make it. Don't you give up. Don't you quit and turn around. Don't you turn around. And just a few verses later, five verses later, he says, and my God shall supply. He will give provision. Oh. All your needs, not all your wants, he said, I will supply what you need. And what you need is a whale. And what you need is a worm to eat up your comfort. And what you need is a wind to unsettle your life. That was God. And the only reason I know it's God because eight verses later, he was saying, I've learned. I've got a perspective of my problems. I've got a perspective of God's provision. And the way that God provides is not Santa Claus and checks and blank. He provides sometimes with what I name a problem. But I look back over my life. I said, I look back over my life and I see a flat tire was him saving my life. I look back over my life, it was a painful breakup that put me in the right place. Come on, for the perfect marriage. It was a whale, a wind, it was worm. He, 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 he blessed me. He gave me a beautiful house. He allowed the house to be burned down. I, I didn't understand it while it was in flames. But my perspective of his provision... He's good. He does things right. Actually, he does them right, doesn't he? He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make failure. He, no. Can, can you imagine as I... I'm going to leave a little credit on my card. I hate to do that, but... Can you imagine Peter, James, or the shepherd? I can imagine that night as they took Jesus. Peter would say... I cursed on that night. I watched him beat my 
my Savior, Jesus Christ. I watched him from afar as they spit on him, and this isn't good. He's hanging on a tree. This is a major problem. The tomb, three days, he's gone. Quickly go to heaven as the paradise, as this story of salvation unfolds. And can you imagine Jonah up in heaven? <laughs> he's not worried. He's looking at it going, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I know what's about to happen. They just, oh, this is, oh. but they're not shouting down on earth because their perspective, oh, come on. Their perspective of it is completely different. Jonah's able to see it because he's already been through it, but Peter's in it. Come on, I said, Peter's in it and Jonah's looking down saying no no the, the cross isn't death that's life the blood shed it's not for him to die it's for you to live his beaten back is not for hell to win it's for health in your body the grave is not the problem the grave is the portal Jesus isn't in trouble this is part of triumph and one day you'll see it one day you'll see it that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his per oh come on you're in a mess that's where the miracle happens you're in a problem that's where provision comes from you're going through a trial God come on works in those places as we stand all across this house you walked in on a Sunday morning and you're in a mess I say it often. I haven't had anybody come to church the morning after they won the lottery. Matter of fact, most people don't come to church the Sunday after their wedding. And that's okay. They're on a cruise ship. Because you don't come to church when things are perfect. A hundred percent of the people that come to my business come in because they got no money they lost their job they're addicted their marriage is falling apart their kids walked out they've got sexual impropriety they've got mental issues every person I've ever encountered that walked into this building came in because of a problem every one of them and they'll come to me and they'll say preacher I've got a problem and if you've ever said it to me, you know my response. I'm like, man, that's great. Because I've learned, I've got a different perspective of your problem. I'm Jonah, and I'm able to look at you and say, oh, that's really good. That means God is working in your life. That means God is providing in your life. Well, hold on. No, no, I need, I need, I, I thought maybe you could, I thought maybe you could, you know, buy me a truck. No, I, I can't buy you a truck. God, God took the truck. That, that, was, that was provision. He needed to take the truck because if he didn't take the truck, you wouldn't have come to church. No, no, just be real honest. Be real honest. If you hadn't had the addiction, you would have never come. Nick, let's be honest. Had you not been in the mess, right, you wouldn't have come. You'd have just kept living your life and doing your thing. But you got in a mess. Come on, somebody. You got in a mess, Jared. You got it. Am I right? Did, some, did anybody come in just because? No, you came in because it was a problem. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. That, what are you saying? If you're in a mess on this Sunday morning, if life has fallen and shattered you into a thousand pieces, welcome to 600 witnesses who say that's what brought us here. Here. But the perspective is it's God's provision. That's God's provision. Oh, hallelujah. I wonder as you right now. Before we rush, we, we, are an, we are an amazing church. We'll rush this altar. Like there's a million dollars up here, and there's actually more than that. There's salvation. But today I kind of want to do it like they board an airplane. I want to give priority access to the most valuable place in this building which is right here I wonder if you could bow your head just for a moment we will all come for to remain in our pew would be selfish because whether you're the prob in a problem or you're going to be the one that God uses as part of the provision you're part of what we're doing next eyes are closed no one's looking it'll be just me and you and there's a pastor saying confidentiality law that I can't break so I ain't going to tell nobody. But if you're in the belly of a whale, or perhaps the worm has eaten up your comfort, maybe the wind is blowing, and you're about to die of heat, life 
isn't perfect and you need a little bit of help and you're wondering why would you just raise your hand would you just raise your hand at me right now not every hand will go up that's right I see hands one two I'm gonna just count for a minute one two three four five six seven eight nine 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I see them in the balcony. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. 22, 22 I've got at least 45 or 50. And the reason I count it is so that those of you with raised hands would know when you come, you're the premier 1K, the global elite, the diamond. You get to board first. You won't be alone. There's a whole group of you. And I wonder if you would just step out from where you are and meet me here. I want to pray with you specifically today. I feel like God gave me this word for you. I need the toes of your shoes to bump up against the front of that first step as we spread out across. I would like our missionary brother Shepherd and Bishop and Dad and our deacons, I want you to come on this platform and spread out across this platform, our elders and deacons, across the front. And in a moment before you will stand men of God who will echo and amen everything that God just spoke to us through me today. Because the reason you're in the problem is because God's using it. It's actually a provision. You'll come through it, but I need you right now to make a commitment not to give up, to hold on, to say, God, I trust you. And as you begin to feel his presence come over you, I wonder if you could just begin to praise him. You don't have to understand it. You can just begin to give him thanks as Jonah did. For those that remain, your objective now is to step out. If you've ever been in a situation where you can look back and say, my perception and my perspective, I should say, of this now has changed to where I see that the drug addiction was actually the miraculous thing that brought me to God. Could you just wave your hand at me and say, yeah, that's my story. Okay, then I want you to come and just, I need you to make sure every, I need there, let there be multiple hands that weigh on the shoulders of these that we love. For those of you, come on, let every, let there be no gap between those. Let your hand, let your testimony be evident by the way, there it is, your hand is like, now if you're standing here with a need, you should feel multiple hands. And I can tell you, even though your eyes are closed, that there's hundreds of people. Amen. Somebody lay your hand over here, right here. Step up, put your hand physically on his back. There needs to be weight. You have to feel, they need to feel the weight of a hand. You're going to feel it from front and before you and behind you. I'm going to take time and pray for each one of you. And I want you, as you begin to pray, it doesn't have to necessarily be moaning. It can just be thanksgiving. It doesn't have to be loud. The people behind you will make up for the volume. Go ahead, people behind. Come on. You're not, you don't have, you're not in the whale's belly anymore. Your perspective is one of praise. Come on. I see it as a, as a place from a place of praise. I see the problem as a place of provision. That's it.